we're going to begin with a testimony from a woman named Lucy Williams. Lucy is uh, a postgraduate student in political theory right now. She goes to Grace City Church, and she's going to come and give us a testimony about her own life as a Christian woman. And that's an example to us of what it means to serve one another, actually, by hearing the stories of one another. So, Lucy, I'll invite you to the front. Please come. Good morning. Um, I'm going to testify to how God has worked in my life. Is that better? Uh, I grew up down the road in Stanmore in a huge family. Mum and Dad had six children, uh, three girls and three boys in that order. It was a bit of a circus most of the time. Uh, We had, you know, the usual hand-me-downs, sheepdog, sometimes chickens, Um, They faithfully took us to church and showed us what it was to have gospel confidence. Around the dinner table, the conversation was always lively. Think cheaper by the dozen. (laughs) Everyone fighting for their chance to speak around a table, buckling under the weight of eight strong personalities and enough food to feed an army. Uh, This upbringing was excellent training ground for high school. With six children, actually the most sensible thing to do is to send your offspring to the very reasonably priced local state-sponsored education facility and hope for the best. My colourful, progressive school in the heart of the inner west was not a hospitable place for the gospel. There were no other Christians in my year, above or below. Uh, But there were syringe clean-ups down on the oval, free piercings in the alleyway after school, uh, and the odd meet and greet with national treasures of the art world. My friends were the children of very intelligent people, um, screenwriters and artists, journalists, and those perhaps involved in the drug industry. Um, I, they're the children of people who thought The idea of God was pretty archaic and probably dangerous. And I would often come up against a knotty issue posed by my well-read, quick-thinking friends. I'd feel a little sheepish, unprepared, put on the spot. Then I'd go home and have a look at what the Bible said about the issue. Issues like atheism 2.0, which was just very exciting when I was in high school. Um, the Four Horsemen and whoever else. Um, Yeah, evolution, questions about science and sexual ethics. So a pattern emerged. I would feel sure in my faith. Um, And then I would hear another intimidating argument. I'd feel insecure about whether the Christian faith had answers. I'd do some research and find that the Bible did have a reasonable response. And I'd feel sure in my faith again. I'm really thankful for this formative period of my life. Again and again, God had answers in the Bible and satisfying answers. Now I'm a postgraduate student at the University of Sydney, just across the road. I read and write and teach political theory, um, or have a go at least. I work with some very learned people, very accomplished, rational thinkers, best in their field, some, uh, but for all their achievements and ribbons and robes, uh, some of the people, a lot of them um, around me, are not quite sure who they are. Reading political theory, it's hard to escape the dominating figure of Swiss philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. His ideas have cast a long shadow over history. Uh, a brilliant mind and a joy to read. Um, Yeah, one of the greatest writers, perhaps. Um, But one of his least useful ideas uh, is the idea that human beings are naturally good. 
and you might be familiar with the social contract's famous opening lines, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. It's a compelling idea. It's not us, it's out there, it's society, oppressive institutions. What a comfort, a blanket of security under which the devout secular humanist can sleep at night. This idea is profoundly tempting and we see it everywhere, but of course it's a lie. But many have bought it, clever, thoughtful people. They hope in education and progress and their work. So for all the things I struggle with most, probably defending my faith is not at the top of the list. Rather, it is absolutely every day of the week at that thing called pride. Pride is the thing. And this is a particularly slippery one for those of us who've grown up in little bastions of Christendom. Um, our family or our church have been protected from the big, blaring, obvious sins. But pride is its huge. It's huge for me, perhaps for you. And speaking of the one and other commands, it's, there's nothing like it to corrode relationship with God and with others. So I could have all the answers in the world, get a PhD, climb the ladder, become an expert in whatever. Uh, but if I don't know who I am, if I think I'm good, or at least not terrible, then I've hopelessly misunderstood the gospel. God has been faithful to me over my 27 years. When I've wandered, he has sought me. When I've questioned, he has answered. When I have thought I was good enough, he has gently reminded me that there's nothing I could do any day of the week to merit his love for me. It is all him. So I finish with a classic quote from the old American theologian, Jonathan Edwards. He simply says, you could tribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. What a relief. Thank you for sharing, Lucy, and thank you for testifying to God's work in your life. Um, it's an encouragement to us and, and a reminder to us, too, of our own sinfulness and need for his salvation. Thank you so much for that. Uh, next, we're going to be welcoming Jane Tour up to the front. Um, today, we have a little bit of a different program in the sense that our speaker, well, it's not different from last year, but our speaker has to join us virtually today because he's in isolation. He's not far away. He's, he's, uh, he just lives over the road, but unfortunately, uh, he can't join us today because of COVID in his family. Uh, but Dr. Peter Orr will be joining us in a moment. But before Peter comes and talks to us about the one another commands, uh, Jane Tour is going to come and speak to us about some of the ways we could think about this practically being worked out in our lives. And many of you will be familiar with Jane, having come to the conferences year on year. But Jane is a, a remarkable uh, woman in that she has a, a very sharp analytical mind and has a way of um, looking around at all kinds of conversations and ideas and being able to take good from them and also categorize them. And, and again, I think her gift is curating resources for us in, in a wonderful way. I seek wisdom from her often. One of the things that I'm really looking forward to is a book that she's just finished on biblical complementarity with Graham Bynan that will be coming out soon, I hope. And I'm very much looking forward to reading it and gleaning wisdom from that. But right now, Jane will be coming to speak to us about some practical ways we can think about the one another commands. Please welcome her. I'm just going to move that because it's for much taller people. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Chase, and um, thanks very much, Lucy. And thank you um, for all of you for coming today and for those of you online as well. It's great um, that you can be here today and it's um, great for me. Um, I'm going to share some things that I've done in terms of what complementarianism can look like in practice from up the front in the um, Sunday church service. And by doing these things, it's another way we can be living out the one another commands 
that Pete is going to speak on very soon. Now, these things I'm about to say are obvious in many ways. Many of them you may have done before, and some of you have heard me speak on them before. But I think it's good to raise them again from time to time because too often we don't do them in our churches or we do them irregularly um, or we, you know, we forget to do them. They take a bit of planning. It's also good to raise them as many people who are coming from a conservative, complementarian view that may or may not be you, um, but many of those people want some ideas of what might be some things that women um, might be able to do up front during the Sunday service. Now, one thing I've done is slots in the church service and also um, on church weekends away. And these slots ideally are connected um, to the Sunday sermon. And therefore, the idea is that the congregation is being further helped to apply the sermon to their life. The preacher definitely does application, otherwise I think he's failed in his sermon. But this is a further extension of that. Um, but sometimes also these slots are not closely connected to the sermon. They could just be more general, further encouragement to the congregation to grow as disciples of Christ. So, it's, you know, more generally. So what's been the shape of these slots? Normally um, six different ones. So interviews, testimonies, book reviews, church history, doctrine, and ministry training skills. So first of all, interviews. Now, they can be helpful for men or women who are not used to being up the front, or the matter they're speaking about is somewhat sensitive, potentially emotional for them. So someone interviewing them can be easier than for them just speaking. Um, interviews can also obviously help keep things on time. Um, the person interviewing can prompt the one being interviewed if they've forgotten things. They can also seek to clarify things. An example I saw that worked really well at my own church um, was at a weekend away a number of years ago. The woman was really nervous being up the front, so she wanted someone to interview her. And she'd been chronically ill for many years. And one of the church elders interviewed her about how church has helped her remain Christian, you know, through those years with her, with her health struggles. So basically how others in the church family had lived out um, the one another commands and also her own Christian testimony. Um, yeah, so it was really encouraging. Another example um, more recently at my church was with two women. One interviewed the other about a Christian book club they're in that our church runs for women. They shared what they're learning, invited other women to join it. So that was, first of all, interviews. Secondly, testimonies. Um, obviously, we've just had one from Lucy. It might be someone's initial conversion testimony or one that is less common that we can, I think that we can do a lot more of is someone sharing, you know, what it's like being a Christian at work, being a Christian and unemployed, you know, or a Christian at uni, being a young mum, going through grief, sharing what it's like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in, you know, the particular life situation that they are at at that point. So the options for this are endless. Now, one example we had at church was a father sharing how he reads the Bible with his two young sons. Thirdly, book reviews. Um, one I did um, was Tony Payne's How to Walk into Church. It fitted with the sermon, so help the congregation prepare for church and being active members once the service begins and also after um, the church service. So helping people live out the one another commands. Fourthly, church history spots. Now, I, th I think this is the forgotten cousin, the poor cousin in many ways. It was good to hear that a number of these happened in 2017, and they happened because it was the 500th year of the anniversary. But we've got a lot of other church history besides the Reformation men and women. So please do them. Um, and it's not just because I'm really passionate about church history. Um, um, yeah, I think there's endless options for different men and women we can speak about, uh, speak on. And these slots can easily link up with a sermon. Um, it doesn't, they don't always have to be on world mission. Um, they can be on a number of other things as well. It's a great way to learn from our Christian brothers and sisters in the past. Um, fifthly, doctrine. It might be that the sermon was, for example, on the book of Jonah and the preacher um, included in his sermon about the relationship between God's will and human responsibility or it may be, you know, about predestination and a man or woman could share how they've come to understand 
you know, those doctrines or that doctrine over time and what, it, what that's meant for them in their Christian walk. And then sixthly, ministry skill training. So one time each week for six weeks, I did um, up front one, um, each of the pages of the two ways um, to live. Um, um, what's not brochure, what's it called? I've just got um, tracked. And um, I taught the congregation two ways to live. Now, um, so what are some questions to consider when thinking about these slots? Obviously, working out what you think is appropriate up front. Um, teaching for women, um, small t teaching, if you like. Um, we have different consciences about that within this room, and obviously different church staffs will have different opinions about that, or um, elders, whatever your church governance is. Um, so the senior pastors or the elders, they especially need to work out what they believe about this issue. Also, the staff or elders need to consider differences when the congregation, within the congregation with what people think is okay, not okay for what women to do up the front and also what non-male elders um, are able to do up the front as well and how you're going to communicate what you're planning on doing um, with the congregation. Another thing to consider is the amount of time and regularity any one individual does them and the message that's sending, so whether that person is male or female. Um, and with these slots, I personally just think it's good to have a variety of men and women do them um, um, in terms of Christian maturity, age, cultural background and things like that. Now, I think the potential for good for our congregations with these different slots is often hugely um, underestimated. They can seem like, oh, it's just five minutes, it's just three minutes, it's, it's no big deal. But good things um, can happen in a really short amount of time, can't they, And when the truth is spoken. Um, but it takes planning from those of us on ministry staff teams, so i.e. a lot of you, um, to make these things happen. I think they can be an excellent way Christians can live out the one another commands. And they help facilitate others living out the one another commands. When they have been done, I have witnessed firsthand congregation members engaging with one another on the topic a lot after the service and in the weeks following. Like they really appreciate seeing a fellow congregation member um, talk about things. Um, yeah, they really help the church family speak Christianly with one another. Thanks, Chase. Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, I'll just add my encouragement that what you've said is true in my experience as well, that those slots are significantly underestimated, but when they do happen, they are hi highly encouraging and, and really do actually generate a different kind of conversation among us. So please take Jane's wisdom and listen to it. Uh, our next time is going to be spent um, with our first session with Dr. Peter Orr. Peter's going to be speaking to us in two halves about uh, the one another commands. You've been given outlines in your packets or you've been sent a PDF online that you can find to follow along with Pete. There aren't any slides to follow with. There's just notes in these outlines for you. Uh, Dr. Peter Orr is a, a very dear friend of mine as well. He, he has... Um, spent his time researching in the New Testament in particular, is an excellent uh, biblical exegete, but also um, a very wise pastoral presence here on the faculty. He cares for students and fellow faculty members alike in um, a very godly way, and, and I have a great appreciation for him. Uh, he's been spending his research time most recently in the Gospel of Mark, which he's written a book on, uh, and he's also written a book on um, us defending our pastors. And so both of these books will be coming out uh, later on. You also might be interested that a recent release has come out with Matthias Media, uh, which Pete has published, um, seeking to explain Christian doctrine to outsiders. That is, it's an evangelistic chance to, to, to tell people about what we actually believe so they can get invited to explore. And he's written that with Rory Shiner. You might like to look out for that. Um, I... We'll be welcoming Pete online with you all, and I encourage you to, I don't know that he'll be able to hear us, but let's welcome him now. Well, thank you, uh, Chase, uh, for that introduction. And uh, I'm very sorry, uh, everyone, uh, that I can't be there with you in person, but it's uh, a real uh, privilege to uh, open up God's word with you. 
and uh, think about this really important uh, topic. And I want to thank uh, Jane as well for the invitation uh, to speak on this topic. Uh, Jane and I uh, chatted about what I might speak uh, on a few years ago, and uh, Jane suggested that looking at the one another passages uh, in Scripture might be a good thing uh, to do, and I thought that was a, a great idea. I wanted to be thorough, uh, so I thought I should at least look at all the mentions of uh, one another language in uh, the New Testament. I was slightly taken aback uh, when I started working through the New Testament and find that the first reference to one another uh, was in Matthew 24, verse 10. Uh, Many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And so that, that took me back. I thought, well, maybe I'll start at the, at the end of the New Testament and work backwards. And uh, the first one I find was in Revelation 6, verse 4. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. But in between those uh, references to eschatological judgment at the beginning and the end of the New Testament, there are many one another passages that express the way uh, which as believers, we need one another and express that need in the way that we serve one another in love. Uh, This one another language is scattered throughout the New Testament. So it's tricky to know exactly uh, how to approach these talks. Uh, We could look at uh, each example of the language and try and build up the picture of what sort of uh, activities are uh, involved in the dynamic. Uh, However, the danger there would be uh, missing the wood uh, for the trees. Uh, So what I've decided to do is to group uh, the text under two headings, which you'll uh, hopefully see from the outlines, and which I think helpfully uh, summarize two of the main relational uh, dynamics that underlie the commands, uh, to love one another and to speak to one another. Now, it's a slightly artificial distinction, and uh, we'll see uh, more why later, but at at the very uh, surface, we can see that it's artificial because obviously one of the key ways that we love one another is to speak to one another. So it's not as if we've got two uh, parallel commands, loving one another and speaking one another, Uh, It's more that loving one another is the overarching uh, idea, and speaking to one another is a particular form of that. Uh, Why look at this topic at the uh, PNA conference? Well, the PNA Center uh, is a center for the encouragement of the ministries of women in partnership with men. Uh, When we think of uh, the ministry uh, of men and women, um, it's easy to sort of gravitate to those. Uh, texts that we find, you know, harder that we've got to understand uh, in our context, 1 Timothy 2, uh, 1 Corinthians 11. Now, we need to think about those texts, obviously, but if we focus on ministry mainly in terms of the more upfront public expression of it, well, we miss a critical strand of the New Testament's teaching, namely that ministry can and should be done at this one another personal level. And that's something that I've really been struck uh, as I've uh, studied uh, this topic. And hopefully, as we look at it this morning, uh, you'll see that as well. As important as preaching uh, to the gathered congregation is, and, and it is, it's, if it's not followed by or does not lead to the ministry of men and women loving one another in the congregation, speaking the gospel to one another, well, then that preaching is not fulfilling its purpose. Like if the one and other commands had the same weight in our congregations that they do in the New Testament, well, then I think it would uh, help counter the false idea that women are somehow not able to do significant ministry because they can't uh, preach to a mixed congregation. It's a reminder that we should not think of ministry primarily in terms of programs, but in terms of an overflow of our identity in Christ. And it's something that we should be doing as men and women. Now, this morning, we'll not always uh, be focusing on that kind of male-female dimension of the commands, but in a sense, everything that we look at this morning is relevant uh, for uh, our ministries as men and women uh, together, as we love one another, as we serve one another, as we speak the gospel to one another. Uh, This topic, I think, is also uh, particularly relevant for our uh, time. Uh, It's a sad fact 
uh, that many pastors are feeling the burden of leading their churches uh, more acutely than ever. Uh, now, a number of factors uh, play into this. Uh, the pressures of the pandemic, uh, increasing expectations of congregation members on their leaders, uh, increasing uh, good and proper requirements uh, for compliance in different uh, ministry areas. All of these and others, some good, some not so good, are combining to increase the pressure on pastoral leadership in our churches. And there are no simple fixes. However, I think there is one aspect that we can address and that I think would have a significant impact. Uh, put simply, uh, the unbiblical expectation that the pastor does all the ministry or that the pastor is the only one responsible for the health of uh, a church. Uh, that idea is, that expectation is not new, but my observation seems to be that it's increasing and it's putting considerable pressure on pastors. Whereas again, if we had the mindset of the New Testament, that ministry was much more than just what happens uh, at the front, uh, but it is about all of us being responsible for and caring for one another, loving one another. Well, then some of the unrealistic and unhelpful pressures pastors are under might be alleviated. So I think it's an important uh, area to look at because of the sheer volume of the material in the New Testament. It's important because it will sharpen our understanding of what ministry as men and women in the local church can and should look uh, like. And I think it's important because it recalibrates the expectations, often unhelpful expectations, that we put on our pastoral leaders. Now, it'd be tempting to jump straight into the, uh, the commands to speak to one another in the New Testament. However, in this first talk, I do want to look at the more fundamental idea of loving one another. And I think this is important because uh, it, it's so prevalent uh, in the New Testament. If we're looking at the commands to love one another, we have to look at the commands. So if we're looking at the, the one another commands, we have to look at the commands uh, to love one another. Uh, secondly, this command, as we've said, is the more fundamental command from which the command to speak to one another flows. It may seem blindingly obvious uh, that we are to love uh, one another. Uh, in one sense, what, you know, why do we need to spend time uh, thinking about it? And yet we'll see that uh, there is a theological and Christological depth uh, to this command that is very easy to overlook. Uh, but if we overlook it, it results, I think, in uh, superficial relationships, which if we're honest, so often, so often we uh, experience in our churches. So in this first talk, I want to consider the commands, the dimension of the commands uh, to love one another. Uh, so focusing not on love in general, uh, and not just love for neighbor or even love for God, but love for one another as Christian brothers and sisters. Why is the command to love one another uh, repeated so frequently in the New Testament? Well, in the outline, we're up to point one, uh, the foundations, uh, why love one another? And the most fundamental answer to that is we love one another because God is love. We love because God is love. Uh, 1 John 5, 16. Uh, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. Uh, God is love. Uh, not that uh, love is uh, God, as if we worship the idea of love, uh, but that God is the model and the source of all love. And the New Testament develops that in uh, two different ways. Uh, the love that God has demonstrated uh, in Christ, uh, the, that's the greatest revelation of his love. Uh, earlier in chapter four, uh, John reflects on how God's love for us in Christ is to be the model for our love for one another. Uh, he writes, uh, verse eight, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. 
And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Very simply, because God has loved us as Christian people, uh, we ought to love one another. And love for one another is the mark that God abides in us. Uh, The mark of a healthy church, obviously, uh, that the truth is being uh, proclaimed, but also that we love one another uh, shows, demonstrates, proves that God dwells amongst us. Uh, This uh, uh, Christ-shaped love is the grind of the command to love one another across the New Testament. We see that particularly in Paul's letters. I've uh, listed a few verses there just uh, to take uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us. We have concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all have died. Ephesians 5, 2, we walk in love uh, as Christ loved us. And so God's love in Christ, God's love for us in Christ is to be the pattern, the model of our love for one another. Uh, Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Uh, That uh, love for one another is shown in our forgiving one another, just as God has forgiven us in Christ. Now, what's uh, interesting about the uh, frequency of these commands to show love to one another in terms of forgiveness modeled on Christ is that they assume that the relationship between Christians will not be straightforward, uh, that these relationships will need continual forgiveness uh, to sustain them. Uh, Sometimes when we think of forgiveness, we think of the kind of big, uh, difficult case, the, the, the case where sort of forgiveness is so hard that Uh, It's really only possible by this incredible act of of grace. And that's good. And it shows the power of forgiveness. But the ubiquity of forgiveness language across the New Testament uh, reminds us that in one sense, it's meant to be much more common and ordinary in our relationships uh, with one another. As we overlook uh, that, that comment that annoyed us or that action that let us down. Uh, as we uh, try not to let them assume a greater significance so that our relationships with one another are cool. It's forgiveness modeled on uh, Christ's love for us. It enables us to love one another in that way. Uh, But uh, this forgiving love is not the only or even the most fundamental way that we're to think of God's love. Uh, There is a more foundational uh, idea, and that is that God is love in his very being, his very essence. And so we can say uh, even more fundamentally, we know that God is love because the love the Father has for uh, the Son. And uh, John's Gospel, you'll know, is where we are given uh, kind of this great insight into the love between the Father and the Son. And a number of places, the love between the Father and the Son is underlined. Um, John 3, 34 He whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. I hear the love that the father has for the son is, is demonstrated by his giving all things into uh, the hands of the son. In this context, primarily that is uh, seen in terms of the gift of the spirit. Uh, unlike the prophets of, of uh, the Old Testament who had uh, uh, you know, the, the, the gift of the spirit kind of temporary or in a limited sense, uh, because the father loves the son, he gives all things, which means he gives the spirit, not in a limited circumscribed sense, but without measure, which means that the son utters the very words of God. And I think these verses uh, in John uh, are, are something of a theological program for our morning. Uh, very simply, love leads to speech. Uh, More fully, the love that the Father has for the Son is manifested in its fullest extent in the giving of the Spirit, which leads to the Son speaking the very words of God. When we love one another, 
we are participating in this love leading to speech prompted by the spirit that the father has for the son. Just to jump uh, ahead to our second session, uh, we will think about the uh, relationship between uh, uh, one another's speech and what we might uh, uh, call sort of more formal congregational preaching. And uh, it's fair to say that there's not been nearly as much theological reflection on one another's speech. But I think we see in John's gospel some of the significance uh, in this uh, speech flowing as it does uh, from the love between the father and the son expressed in spirit prompted speech. But we'll come back to this. Uh, these ideas are developed uh, in uh, John uh, chapter 5. Uh, the father loves the son uh, and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For the son raises the dead and gives, gives them life. So also the son gives life to whom he will. Uh, the love that the father has for the son is seen in the father giving everything to the son and revealing everything to the son. Uh, and uh, there's this uh, wonderful uh, openness uh, of revelation and of giving. And the grounds of the father's love for the son is the son's perfect obedience to the father. Uh, chapter 10, verse 17, for this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. And wonderfully, uh, as believers, we can enter into that love by loving Jesus. At chapter 16, verse 27, I should say, I'm, I know I'm kind of uh, rattling off these verses. They're all on the outline. So do uh, have the outline and follow along. And uh, hopefully that will, uh, that will help. Chapter 16, verse 27, uh, for the father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. But perhaps the most uh, revealing passage is Jesus' extended prayer in John 17, uh, where Jesus prays to his father uh, on the eve of his death. And he concludes by praying for those who would uh, come to believe in him through the testimony of the disciples. And he reflects in verse 26, I made known to them uh, your name, Father, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. So Jesus, on the eve of his death, prays for unity amongst believers. And more than that, he prays that the love that the Father has for the Son may be in them. As uh, Don Carson puts it in his commentary, uh, the crucial point uh, is that this text does not simply make these followers the object of God's love. We, we, we are obviously the object of God's love, but promises that they will be so transformed as God is continually made known to them that God's own love for his son will become their love. The love with which they learn to love is nothing less than the love amongst the persons of the Godhead. So in other words, our love for one another is modeled on and has its source in the love that the Father has shown us in Christ, and even more fundamentally, the love that the Father has for the Son. That's the significance of uh, uh, the command uh, to love one another. It's modeled on what God has done in Christ. And it has the source in the love that the Father has for the Son. Why do we love one another? Well, we've seen Paul generally gives us the answer. We love one another because God has first loved us in Christ. John agrees, uh, but also records Jesus giving the more underlying idea of this reflecting uh, the love that the Father has for the Son, and that this lo love uh, might actually be uh, in us as believers. So in considering the topic of the one another commands, and particularly this fundamental command to love one another, as distinct to uh, important as they are, that the commands to love our enemies or our neighbor in general, but we have a command that is grounded in the very nature of the gospel 
and the very nature of God himself. You know, lo loving one another, it's, that's not a controversial uh, topic. And perhaps because it's not controversial, we don't give it the attention that it deserves. Uh, you know, they're not great debates uh, about, you know, loving one another. And so perhaps we don't apply the kind of good, critical, deep thinking that we could. But, you know, very simply, we can ask, you know, is our church fellowship modeling this kind of love? The model, uh, is it modeled on the love that God has for us? Am I, as a member of a church fellowship, growing in my love for my fellow believers in this way? Am I seeking to model my love on the, the love that God has shown me in Christ? and the love that the Father has for the Son. But the second reason that we are to love one another in particular is because of who we are. Because of uh, who God is, because of who we are. Uh, sadly, many Christians have a very light idea of their relationship to other Christians. And uh, you can see this uh, you know, in, in thinking about church, uh, many uh, Christians even think of church as a performance we attend, and uh, how happy we are on any given Sunday depends on how well the performers at the front did, uh, the singers, the prayers, the preachers. Uh, so that's one way we can think of it, or we can think of it as a voluntary club, like a, a book club or a sports club. Now, here we're more committed, uh, as long as it suits us and as long as it meets our uh, our kind of needs and wants. If it doesn't suit us, if it disappoints us, if the club doesn't take the direction that we uh, like, well, we just join, we just leave and join another club that does suit us. In contrast, uh, the New Testament uses much more organic imagery when it discusses the relationship between uh, believers. And I want us to look at uh, two, the idea of the family, and the idea of uh, the body. Uh, so the, the idea or the language of the church as uh, family, the household of faith, uh, is found uh, throughout the New Testament. Uh, believers are described as brothers and sisters. God is our father. We are his sons and daughters. Uh, we are heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ. Uh, with the idea of family is the corresponding idea of love. And uh, one letter that connects the two together in a profound way is 1 Peter. So 1 Peter 1 verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. So in this passage, uh, we have a central command at the end of verse 22, love one another earnestly or deeply. And uh, there are two reasons or two grindings for that command. Uh, first, in verse 22, their souls have been uh, purified or sanctified through their obedience to the truth. Now, this seems to be the language of what we might call conversion. Uh, you, you, you are converted people. You've been set apart. You're different. Uh, you're not like the world. You've been uh, set apart. Uh, you've responded positively to the truth. And the goal of that is, as Peter says, for a sincere brotherly love. It's quite striking, isn't it, that Paul says the reason for their conversion, it, its purpose, its goal, is that they might love one another sincerely. In other words, one another love is, is not an optional extra, but it's the very goal and purpose of your conversion. But the second reason uh, for the command to love one another, he gives is verse 23. That since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. In other words, you were converted so that you might love one another because you were born again. You were converted so that you might love one another because you were born again by the imperishable living and abiding 
word of God. Uh, why would being born again by the living and enduring word of God be a reason to love one another earnestly? Uh, I hope you can see that the connection, that the, the reason that we love one another earnestly is because we've been born again uh, by the living and enduring word of God. I think the way to think of it is uh, to think of the word of God as our spiritual DNA. That's the way that uh, Karen Jobes in her one uh, Peter commentary uh, discusses it. Uh, the word of God as our DNA connects us uh, to one another as family. Uh, it's true that every human being is created in the image of God. And that's what distinguishes us from the rest of creation. Uh, but more specifically, uh, as Christians, we are created, we are recreated. We are born again uh, by the word of God. And this is significant for Peter throughout his letter. Uh, this idea of deep brotherly love is stressed. And it's really interesting. Uh, this is a, um, a set of churches, set of Christians under considerable pressure from the outside uh, uh, world in, the terms of, in terms of derision and insult. In other words, the context that Peter is writing to is a, is a context that matches very much uh, our own. It's not uh, a context of kind of acute uh, physical persecution. It's the persecution of derision and insult. And yet the thing that he stresses is their need to love one another as they stand together in a world that's very much uh, like ours. But this love flows from a particular root, and it flows from the root of the nature of our rebirth by the word of God into a new family where the word of God defines our DNA. And if I can uh, mix the metaphor a little bit, uh, we'll see that as we speak the word to one another, in a sense, it strengthens our DNA. Now, I know that that's not biologically possible, but, but the idea, I think, uh, works. You know, the idea of strengthening and appreciating what binds us uh, together. We deepen our sense of family, and we make it easier to love one another. Uh, a few years ago, I met my uh, second cousin once removed. Uh, his family had moved to Australia from Ireland uh, about 100 years ago. And uh, when my parents came out to, to visit us, you know, my dad was very keen uh, to meet him. Initially, I was a little bit less enthusiastic. You know, your second cousin once removed. It's not exactly a close uh, family uh, member. Uh, but what I found was, that, you know, as we sort of traced the family tree on the, on the dining table, we worked out how we were related. Um, he and my, my dad's grandparents were siblings. If you're interested, uh, I can show you the family tree uh, at, a, at a later point. Anyways, we worked it out. We, we did have this sense of connection. In one sense, he was a complete stranger, but in another sense, he was family as we, as we trace the connection. As we speak the word of God to one another, uh, we, so to speak, we trace the family tree. Uh, we deepen the sense of connection. Uh, that we have uh, with one another. It's why, I mean, you experience it when you, when you, uh, you know, you have your first meeting of a new home group at the beginning of the year uh, compared to the last meeting. You've had a year of, of kind of reading God's word, growing together. You do have that sense of much deeper connection. And Peter says the goal of our conversion is sincere or unhypocritical love issuing from a pure heart. The reason to love one another earnestly is because that's the very goal, the very reason that we were converted in the first place. And we love one another since we share the same DNA, the word of God. We were born into the same family by the same means, uh, the word of God. So the word of God is what connects us to one another. Uh, we bear the particular imprint of God in his word. And we've seen what is the nature of God? Well, it is love. God is love. We love because God loved us. We love because God is love. Uh, but not simply as a sort of external example out there to follow. Uh, God dwells in us. And more than that, we've been born again by the very word of God. God's word, his revelation of his own self is our DNA. And so to fail to love one another would be to utterly deny who we are. So Peter uses this image of, of family 
Paul uses the image of the body uh, where we're members of one another. And he does this in a number of places. And uh, I just want to very briefly look at one in uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's outlined uh, the principle that no one part of the body is more important uh, than uh, the other. So verse 24, God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Uh, we are the body of Christ and there is a basic uh, equality, an organic equality between us as members. Uh, when we consider what this looks like in church life, I think it addresses the idea that unless the pastor is caring for me, well, the church is not caring for me. No, the members are to care for one another. Uh, in fact, uh, verse 25, uh, the words that they may have the same care for one another. Again, you can have a look in the commentaries and you can see the underlying Greek is actually uh, quite a bit stronger. It's the idea of being anxious for one another. Uh, we're not indifferent uh, to one another, uh, it's spiritually, physically, however, we are anxious for one another's well-being. That's a wonderful picture, isn't it? it you know, it's not just the, uh, the, the pastor who's anxious uh, for the spiritual state of the people in his uh, churches. We're all anxious uh, for one another. Uh, in terms of the question of our uh, uh, section of this talk, why do we uh, as Christians especially love one another? Well, Paul adds this uh, organic uh, physical language to the family uh, image that Paul has already given us. Uh, we love one another because we are members of the same uh, body. And you can see that Paul puts it even more strongly in Romans 12, verse 25. Uh, we are members of one another. So we love one another because of who God is. We love one another because of who we are. We are not attendees at a performance. We are not volunteers uh, at a club. We are family. We are one body, members of one another. But thirdly, we love one another because of the time. We love one another because of the time. In John 13, 34, Jesus says something which on the surface might appear a little odd. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, so uh, you are to love one another. Well, in what sense is the command to love one another a new command? Uh, in fact, when John reflects on this idea in his second letter, he specifically says that it's not a new command. So 2 John 1, 5, but now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one you have had from the beginning that we love one another. So in what sense is it old? What sense is it uh, new? Now, obviously, the, the command to uh, love is deeply rooted in the Old Testament. Uh, Leviticus 19, verse 18, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Uh, later in the chapter, this gets extended. Chapter 19, verse 34, you shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So in Leviticus, you have these two strands, love for neighbor, love for the stranger, and both are to be loved as you love yourself. And uh, Fast forward to Mark chapter 12, when Jesus is asked what the two most important commandments of the law are. Well, he says uh, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, uh, soul, mind, with all your strength. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. What's interesting is that uh, Jesus summarizes the Old Testament via these two commands. Love uh, the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And yet this uh, second commandment, love the neighbor, your neighbor as yourself, is not actually repeated or even alluded to in the Old Testament in its textual form. Uh, that is, th the idea of loving God is, is repeated right throughout the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms. The actual language of loving your neighbor is not. Uh, that is, love and neighbor are not bound together elsewhere in the Old Testament, not 
obviously the idea is there, although even when it's there, it's usually in the form of not doing something negative to your neighbor. And that's true right back in Leviticus 19, as, as Leviticus 19 sort of unpacks what it means to love your neighbor. Uh, 19, 13, you shall not oppress your neighbor. At 19, 17, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. At chapter 24, verse 19, uh, if anyone injures his neighbor, uh, uh, as he has done, it shall be done to him. Chapter 25, verse 17, uh, you shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God. Now, it's true that there are uh, other related ideas, uh, the idea of being generous. Proverbs 14, 21, whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. Uh, or the idea of loving mercy, Micah 6, verse 8, what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy? So I don't want to overstate it, but it, it is interesting that this kind of language of love and neighbor is that the language itself is not used uh, throughout the Old Testament. And when the concept is there, and it is, uh, it's generally, generally the avoidance of uh, the negative as the command to love your neighbor is reflected upon in the rest of the Old Testament. The main idea is the avoidance of doing evil to your neighbor. However, in the New Testament, I think that helps us to understand what the newness of the new commandment, uh, the newness of the commandment is, in that it has this positive shape in that it is modeled on the Lord Jesus. So again, John 13, 34, a new commandment I give that you love one another just as I have loved you you are to love one another. John 13, 15, I've given you an example uh, that you should do just as I have done uh, for you. Uh, Jesus is the example, the model that we are to follow. Uh, it's, new, it's a new commandment because loving one another now means loving uh, one another just as Jesus has loved us. And so the newness comes from the, the incarnation, the death of Jesus. He is the one who has come and revealed God to us. He is the one who has exemplified this love perfectly in his uh, sacrificial death on the cross. And so in his first letter, John uh, reflects on this tension. Is it a new commandment? Is it an old commandment? Chapter one, verse se uh, seven. Behold, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing you, which is true in him and in you. Why? Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. It's an old commandment. The command to love is, as we've seen, deeply embedded in the Old Testament. But it's a new commandment because it comes to truth in Christ. And because of the time, uh, verse 8, the darkness is passing away. The true light is already shining. And so it's a new command because of the time that we are in, a time when darkness is passing away and the light of Christ is already shining. Now, all of this may seem like overkill. Uh, you know, we're analyzing love uh, to death. Uh, but I think if we grind the command to love one another in these theological realities, it will help us to persevere even when we don't feel like uh, loving one another. Uh, this command to love one another is not simply a bare command, but it is something that reflects the reality of the God we love and serve, uh, the reality of the times we find ourselves in, and the reality of our very Christian DNA. Well, let's think about uh, loving uh, one another in practice. Uh, when we examine the commands uh, relating to loving one another, uh, we, we see a spectrum. At the end of the spectrum is 1 John 3, 11. Uh, this is the message you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Uh, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. So basically, uh, love one another means don't murder one another. Uh, the other end of the spectrum, though, is a chapter later. Uh, chapter 4, verse 10, this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us, sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Love one another like Jesus. So there's the spectrum. Don't murder each other. Love each other like uh, Jesus. 
Uh, the one is uh, that the that, that's the absolute uh, minimum that we're avoiding, and the other is the maximum that we are uh, striving for. Uh, to summarize, though, the New Testament, um, I'm just going to read out uh, some of the, the commands related to this idea of, of loving one another, and then we'll look at uh, one particular passage in a little bit more detail. So just uh, to summarize uh, the New Testament, be at peace with one another, show honor to one another, live in harmony with one another, uh, do not pass judgment on one another, welcome one another, greet one another, wait for one another at the Lord's Supper, care for one another, uh, or be anxious for one another, uh, comfort one another, agree with one another, serve one another, do not bite and devour one another, do not provoke envy of one another, uh, bear with one another in love, be kind to one another, be kind to one another, forgive one another, submit to one another, do good to one another, show hospitality to one another, serve one another, and be humble towards one another. You can see that kind of range of contexts and, and different uh, ways that we can express this love uh, for one another. But I want us to focus on, on one passage, which I think uh, helps us to think practically uh, what this might look at like. Uh, 1 Peter 4, verse 8, 10, verse 8 to 10. And as I read it, uh, you'll see that Peter mentions one another, uh, that one of my, this idea of one another three times. Verse 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. And as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's buried grace. Uh, these three one another commands, I think, helpfully capture uh, a good um, spectrum of, of what it means uh, to love one another. So firstly, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. And we've thought about this already, uh, this uh, idea of love in the context of forgiveness. Uh, keep loving one another. And then Peter says very strongly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Now, Peter's not giving us a theology, a full extensive theology of atonement. Uh, his point is really what we've seen already, that human relationships need this kind of forgiveness to survive. Uh, this forgiveness means we do not always have to confront uh, the other person. Uh, we don't always have to call them to repentance for every wrong thing they do to us. There are times when we should do that, obviously, uh, but there are times uh, when we should not even mention the wrong done to us and simply overlook it. Uh, Proverb, Proverbs reminds us that, that good sense makes one slow to anger and it is his glory to overlook an offense. As evangelicals, obviously, we take sin seriously. We know that repentance is critical. We know that sin is so serious that Jesus had to die for our sin. Uh, but there is a place in human relationships for overlooking and not confronting every sin. Uh, every good marriage operates on that principle, as does any healthy friendship, including relationships with one another in our churches. Uh, the minister of a church I went to uh, years ago in a, in a different country uh, had a terrible uh, memory. I don't just mean that he occasionally uh, forgot where he left his keys. Uh, his memory loss was on a totally different uh, level. He once had to fill up his car with petrol, but when he arrived at the petrol station, he realized that he'd walked. Another time, uh, he did remember to drive to the petrol station. Uh, he filled up the car, but when he arrived home, he realized that he'd walked home and he'd left his two sons at the petrol station. Now, uh, this inability to remember things uh, did not combine well with uh, one of his more positive uh, characteristics, and that was a, a strong commitment to welcome newcomers to our church. And uh, stories abounded of him welcoming people as visitors after they'd been coming to our church for weeks. One of my friends actually took umbrage um, when he was uh, greeted for the third week running. Oh, hello, are you new? Welcome. 
And the response was, no, I'm not. This is the third time we've met in as many weeks. I won't be coming to this church anymore. Now, my friend's reaction was incredibly ungracious, especially since my pastor, the pastor had not done anything wrong. What about, though, when wrong is actually done to us by others? Uh, Paul uh, explores that in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, and where he talks about relationship breakdown between Christians in the Corinthian church. And uh, people were actually taking their Christian brothers and sisters uh, to court, to secular courts, and, and Paul is uh, appalled. Now, this is, uh, this is kind of what we, we might call civil court cases. This is not criminal matters. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, breakdown in relationship that caused maybe some sort of financial uh, issue. Uh, but Paul is appalled. It, it, it's such a bad witness before unbelievers. It's a failure to realize that the church uh, should actually be equipped to solve such uh, problems. But uh, Paul lays down a principle that I think it, it illustrates what we're thinking about. Uh, Paul's principle is, why not rather be wrong? It's quite striking in here. Why not rather be wrong? And really, all that is, is Paul's application of Jesus' command to turn the other cheek. There's a time and a place, not always, but there is a time and a place to let go of formal justice and just bear the wrong ourselves, of overlooking the offense, of turning the cheek, and of moving on. Now, I think we, we, we recognize that in the kind of small level sort of uh, conversations, the thing that someone says that's, uh, that's annoying or slightly hurtful, they interrupt you, they talk over the top of you, what, whatever it might be. But 1 Corinthians 6, I think, as it applies Jesus' teaching, sort of widens it out and uh, gives it an edge and says, you know, there could be even um, considerably more significant issues where you just let it go and you just rather be wrong. Uh, there's wisdom in working out when actually you say, no, I, I'm going to actually take this further. But I think the challenge, though, that we're seeing is the application of what, uh, what Peter is saying, is uh, that, you know, love will, will overlook, uh, will overlook uh, sins. Uh, but secondly, uh, Peter says, verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Not hospitality uh, in the New Testament is uh, one of the marks of the Christian community, and particularly of those in Christian leadership. Uh, it's not a very common word in the New Testament. And when the word is used by Christians just after the New Testament, as they seek to apply uh, the New Testament, it's most often used in the context of contributing to the mission of the gospel by hosting traveling teachers and uh, evangelists. And it's quite interesting that the way that Peter uses it here, because the word um, hospitable, it, it sort of means loving the stranger. And so the idea of loving the stranger amongst one another, uh, I think it is talking about a, a sort of wider uh, love of, of, of you know, Christians from outside of your fellowship. And as we see it applied outside the New Testament, it's got that particular dimension of contributing uh, to uh, the, the mission of the gospel. Uh, hospitality was important uh, with you know, traveling evangelists. You know, think, think of Paul in the New Testament how much he depended on the hospitality of uh, the churches that he was, uh, was visiting. And uh, I've put just out of interest a, a text from the Didache, uh, which is a, a second century Christian text that shows that, uh, you know, this traveling, um, these, these kind of traveling evangelists, he describes them as apostles or prophets. Um, you know, there, there were uh, ones who took advantage and uh, the way that you could uh, tell if they take advantage is if they stay longer than three days or if they ask uh, for money. And so, you know, you, you might apply that to, to visitors uh, to your house. Uh, but uh, critically, Peter adds the idea of without grumbling, you know, show hospitality without grumbling, uh, acknowledging that those who open their homes, those who have the means to open their homes might grow tired of the service. However, they're exhorted to be hospitable uh, gladly. Uh, not giving in to the temptation to begrudge those who ask them. But this command, um, I, I think, is a reminder that the mission of the gospel in the first century depended not simply on the, the leaders uh, of the churches, but on every member as they served alongside one another, as they opened up their homes to visiting preachers and even opened up their homes uh, for uh, Christian meetings. Again, in the context of men and women serving together, I think this is a, a wonderful example of 
the importance of the variety of every member of ministry for the progress of the gospel. You know, those who were showing hospitality in the first century, that was important. Uh, it wasn't a, a sort of, uh, you know, insignificant aspect to the spread of uh, the gospel. Uh, well, the third one another uh, widens uh, this out, this practical care for one another in the local context. Verse 10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And then that seems to uh, serve as a heading uh, for the next verse, 11. Whoever speaks as one uh, who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So I think this is really uh, interesting and um, the way that sort of love one another is the heading. And then he can talk about serving one another and uh, speaking uh, to one another. So speaking to one another will be the, uh, the next talk, but serving one another here, it's just this general term that encapsulates a, a range of activities. You know, it's, it's broad enough. We, we could just use our imagination. There's so many ways that we can serve uh, one another. Uh, meals for the sick, comfort for the grieving, financial assistance uh, for the struggling, uh, grocery shopping for the isolated, uh, you know, so many ways that we can uh, serve uh, one another. We also should be willing to receive service and care from one another. Uh, a friend who's a pastor recently wrote this to me. Uh, a family was threatening to leave our church because they felt unloved. After a long conversation, it became clear that what they meant was the pastor isn't my best friend. Uh, lots of people in the church were loving them, uh, but because the pastor only occasionally had them over socially, they felt neglected. Uh, sadly, when it was pointed out that the pastor can't possibly be everyone's best friend and that the church as a body was doing wonderfully well, it was still not enough. But not just the extreme cases, uh, as if serving one another only applies in a crisis. It should simply be the default way that we love uh, one another. We forgive, we serve. It's God's varied grace. Well, finally, as we conclude, uh, loving one another as brothers and sisters. We love one another earnestly from the heart, as Peter puts it. We love because of God, because of who we are, and because of the time. Uh, we love uh, as we forgive one another, as we overlook sins. We love as we serve one another in a whole host of different ways. Uh, we love as brothers and sisters, the commands to love one another, not distinguished in male and female terms. They're a reflection uh, that we are in Christ as brothers and sisters, members of one another. The word of God is our DNA. And so our second talk in one sense will not be a separate one, but it will be an extension of this one. If nothing else, the reminder is that we are all responsible for one another. Uh, think of a family with a loving uh, mom and dad and uh, three teenage kids. I've got four kids, so this is not an autobiographical story. Uh, mom and dad are caring and kind. In many ways, it's the model, a uh, loving, healthy family. And yet anytime the parents ask the kids to do anything, they whine and complain and, and they never show any initiative. They're demanding. They shout at their siblings. They only communicate with their parents to complain. They basically believe that the world revolves around them. Uh, that's, that's not a healthy family. But nor is a church where the members only speak to the pastor when they want to complain about something. Or who are indifferent to one another. Or who are passive consumers. Who are ready to leave the church when things don't go their way. Now, a healthy church will be one where all the members take it upon themselves to love one another deeply, to be anxious for one another, and to serve one another, forgive one another, love one another. It's striking, and, and with this I'll conclude, that the letter where Paul is most concerned to defend the gospel, uh, Galatians, uh, they, this is the letter with some of the strongest commands for Christians to relate well to one another. And really, that's not surprising because the two are connected. We haven't preserved the gospel if it's not translating into this deep, loving service of one another. And, and towards the end of the letter, he makes a strong call for how they're to relate to one another. 
Galatians 5, 13, uh, you were called to freedom, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve. And again, the commentaries will point out that the Greek is, is much stronger. It's through love, be enslaved to one another. Through love, consider yourself a slave of one another. That's what it means uh, to relate to one another. Well, we'll leave it there and we'll pick it up um, uh, after the break when we uh, think about what it means to speak to one another. Thank you.